Paige, I'm so happy that you're here. I was just telling you before we officially hit record that I literally, and my podcast audience, if they ever see me on Instagram, they know I'm telling the truth. I, I love Aviator Nation so much. Um, this whole vibe, everything about it, softness, yumminess, coolness, colors. Um, I've wanted to get to know you and hear all about what would the what the sparks of magic were that kind of allowed you to create all of this and how you've been just doing all this just beautiful thing while being you and how you're managing it all. So why don't you take us back before we get into the, the origin story? Is there any clue in your childhood that tells you, you think you might become an entrepreneur? Yeah. I mean, it's so funny. I was literally selling everything when I was little. Um, I think that, well, first of all, I, I realized that I like to buy things. I realized that I like to shop. Um, I think it, in the beginning, it was probably candy that I wanted or whatever as like a young little girl. And it was pretty cool because every time I asked my dad for something or my mom or my parents, whatever, my grandparents, they were always like, yeah, you can have whatever you want, but you have to work for it. And they always made me like do some kind of task to like get what I wanted, which I think is so interesting. And obviously someday, um, you know, hopefully if I have kids, like I can do the same thing because I thought, I just feel like that was so amazing that I was brought up that way. And the reality is, you know, like everybody wants things like kids want things, you know, but instead of just like giving everything to me, they would, my dad would be like, okay, water the plants. And then I'll buy this for you. You know, like you can do this and, and then I'll take you to the candy store, you know? And so I knew that I love, so once I started to do that, you know, I realized, okay, you know, I want this. My dad would be like, well, mow the lawn. I'll give you, you know, $25 and then you can go buy it. And there was something that I loved about buying stuff for myself. Um, I just loved that. And so I think that that made me realize that I needed to be making money so that I could do that. And then I opened a lemonade stand and a cookie stand. And I, I actually learned how to make donuts. And I thought selling donuts in front of my house would be a great way to make money on a weekend. And I did it. And then um, I got creative. I would like buy lollipops and take them to school and sell them for like more than I bought them for. Um, you know, I was literally like wheeling and dealing all the time. I mean, like constantly. So yes, I definitely had the entrepreneur spirit in me from a young age. That's really crazy because I ask you that question just like on a lark, like I wonder, and then you're like, oh, let me just tell you, you don't even know the half of it. No wonder your whole family is entrepreneurial. It's like, I got it now. I got it. And that really is such a lesson to all of us who are sitting here as parents. I'm, I'm a mom of three daughters. What a cool thing. If that had anything to do with the way in which you get to have this passion project you're doing now that also makes money, that also creates a whole vibe for people. Like if that has anything to do with it, note to self as a parent. Okay. So then, so then along comes what you're up to now. Okay. But we don't really know how the heck you did that. And I've done a little research on it and it's so cool. Just what I read. Can you take us through the origin story? How did this little thought in your brain become as big as it is now? What happens first? What happens second? And how does it wind up being the thing? Everyone's buying everyone for Christmas. Like what, tell us the story. How did, how did you build aviator nation? Yeah. So I literally, so basically first I decided that I loved California. I was going to school at Arizona state. I was studying journalism. I loved to write. And I thought that I wanted to be working at a magazine or something like that. So I started out in school doing journalism. And then I visited a friend that lived in California while I was at ASU. Cause it was only like, you know, not that far of a drive. And I came to California and my friend's brother like lived on the beach and we went surfing one day and it was my first time to ever surf or be in the ocean really on the West coast. And I completely fell in love with it. And um, so that was really kind of the beginning of, I think, you know, everything that Aviator Nation became or has become because it really started out with my lifestyle. And so I came to California, I surfed, I realized, oh my God, I need to be in California. So I ended up, I went back to school and then I ended up, you know, coming out after school and, um, and I got a job. I, I was always a person that liked to do a variety of things. And so I was working at a surf shop. Um, I was uh, waiting tables and I was also doing photography because I minored in photography in college. And so while I was doing all these things, I was working at the surf shop. 
And I realized how much I love that like small surf shop kind of vibe. So that was when I really became like kind of into retail. Like I loved to shop, you know, from a young age and I loved fashion, but working in the surf shop, I think really had an impact on me because obviously I was in the lifestyle, but I was working, you know, in an environment that was so fun. It was all these, you know, kids that like surfed and skated and it was just such a great vibe and I really loved it. And so while I was working at the surf shop, I actually, um, I became a, an assistant to the buyer. And so I was around clothes all the time because the buyer's constantly going through catalogs and I was like looking at stuff and I always wanted something that was different than like what was in the catalog. I was like, oh, this would be so cool, but like, I don't like the colors or, you know, and, and then I realized, even when I was shopping and even with the clothes that we were buying for the surf shop, I'm like, I just want it to be like softer, you know? And so I started kind of shopping a lot at vintage stores and, um, and, and I realized my passion was really the super old broken down clothes, you know, like the sweats and stuff. And I was wearing vintage all the time. And, but then it was like, of course, the fit wasn't always what I wanted, you know, when I would buy vintage and then the colors still might've been not quite what I wanted. So basically at that point I bought a sewing machine and it was totally just for myself. I wanted to make the clothes that were like in my head, you know, I wanted to, take the super soft, you know, sweatshirt that I bought at the thrift store, Goodwill or whatever. And then, you know, basically sew what I wanted on the sweatshirt or alter the sleeves or, you know, whatever, adjust the fit. And so I basically started making clothes. And then I started making clothes from scratch because when I found a garment that I really loved, I took it apart and I was like, oh, I, like that's how I kind of figured out how to sew something together. I'm like, I can take this apart, literally trace it on any fabric and then I can cut it out and make another garment that's the same fit. So I found my favorite t-shirt and then I was literally making other t-shirts out of softer material because I wanted the fit of this one, but the fabric needed to be like this. So, um, so anyway, obviously I realized, I mean, I would be up all night doing this. It was so much fun. I was literally making clothes and I loved fashion. So for me, it was like a dream situation that I learned how to make clothes. And so anyway, I started wearing the clothes to work at the surf shop and I went to trade shows with my boss at the surf shop and literally people were coming up to me nonstop and they were like, what are you wearing? What is that? Cause it had this like super kind of handmade look. Cause I was making it, you know, I was a rookie and, uh, but it had all these cool colors and it looked washed out and whatever. And like, it was, it was magnetic and it, people came out of nowhere and they wanted to know what it was. They were like, what brand is that? Where did you get that? And I just told people, you know, I made it myself I made it myself. And after so much, you know, like as a young girl that knows like she likes to sell things and whatever. I was like, I need to be making these clothes and selling them. Um, so I basically did that. I sewed up a bunch of clothes. I heard about a flea marker, a street, street fair that was happening in Venice at the Abbott Kinney Festival, um, which you probably know if you live on the West Side, like it's still a thing. And so once a year on the Abbott Kinney Street in Venice, it shuts down and it's all kind of like local crafts people and stuff. So I got a booth for $500. I sewed up as much as I could between then and when the, when the thing was happening. And I made $8,000 in one day literally selling, you know, sweats that I had made myself. Um, so after that was the very first time I ever sold it. And after that day, I was like, oh my God, I need to focus on this. Like, this is a real thing. People are obsessed. Um, it's crazy. And so I decided that I would kind of make a collection because I knew being, you know, in the retail world with the surf shop, that brands kind of come up with a collection. And so, so I made a little collection. I spent three months sewing a collection. And then I went to what I thought was the best store in town, which was Fred Siegel in Santa Monica at the time. Um, and I just walked in wearing it. And I had photos that I had taken of myself wearing it because it was just a one man show at that point. And um, I walked in and I was like, hey, I live in Venice. I live down the street. I made these clothes. I love your store. I want you to be the first people. If, I, if you don't buy it, someone else will. And so anyway, they were like, well, the buyer's not here. You know, you don't just like walk in and, and, and make a deal happen here. You have to like, you know, get an appointment and whatever. And, and I was like, okay, that's fine here. I left my stuff. And then um, I was leaving the parking lot and my phone rang. And sure enough, it was the buyer at Fred Siegel. She saw me come in and she wanted to meet with me. And so that was pretty much, you know, the beginning. And she, and I said, yes, of course, I'll come back tomorrow. I'll show you the collection. She placed a huge order. That was my first order. Um, and yeah, 
So that was really the beginning. And then it was really just kind of after that, I realized that, you know, maybe I should do a trade show and um, because I wanted to, you know, get the word out there. And so I talked to some people and I found out what the best trade show was in Las Vegas. And I went there and um, in like a couple of days, I sold over $150,000 worth of clothes at a trade show. And so that was when I was like, okay, this is like really happening. But um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how I got to where I am now, uh, or at least the beginning of the story. You know, uh, that Owl City song about fireflies, just like yeah. listening, listening to you talk is like somebody took a jar of fireflies and just put me inside of the swirl of all those lights. That's how I just felt. And that, like you ask Nicholas Tesla, like, what did he say? Like, if you want to know something about the world is frequency, because when you described going surfing for the first time and how it felt, and then you described how it felt to work in the surf shop. Yeah. And then as you're talking and you've probably now told this story countless times, I'm still vibing. I'm still feeling the energy of you in the water for the first time. And I could literally feel because of your smile, like you guys can't see her right now, but like your smile and like this, like very Willy Wonka way that you started to like peel back what you hadn't seen before. And it was like being uncovered to you as you were working in the surf shop. And then you couldn't stop making the clothes till like two in the morning. And I was like, this is why it's so successful. Like even as you tell the story for the 1 millionth time right now, you like your whole face is lighting up because of the feeling. And that's what's so fun about actual reality, like not how people think reality is, but like the degree to which you felt what you felt in the ocean, in the surf shop, you translated it into something physical. And yeah. that's why it works. And I love it because we've done this show. We've done 700 episodes with everybody from Tamara Mellon to... Matthew McConaughey is now close to you where you are physically geographically, but like we've had so many entrepreneurs and so many people here and Bobby Brown and makeup artists and all, and it's always the story. This is always the story. It's like, okay, well, there was this feeling and then I started to trust it and then I started to let it lead me. And then, and nowhere in the story does this linear 3D thinking come in. Like, but I was like, how will I ever do this? And how can I get, well, who am I to walk into Fred Siegel? And like, no, because your enthusiasm was so much bigger than you that there wasn't even a choice. It was just like, it was like a train. You like got on a train and the train was moving and you just had to like stay on it. So I yeah. just, I'm just like, I just love it because I'm thinking of myself going into the aviator shop that's across from the Malibu pier. And I'm like, oh my God, you literally like created like exactly what you felt. <laughs> and it's just like such a vibe for those of you who are not in LA. When you come to LA next Paige has a shop, one of the many places where you can buy aviator. And it's like, a, it's like Austin powers made himself like a cool hangout plus a surf shop. Plus you can get like, you can listen to music. It's like, it's just such a, it's so cool. Um, let's break this down a little bit. Let's break this down a little bit. So for people who are listening, okay, and they're like, I want what she's eating it's, and, and ingesting. I want this energy. What do you think about how you yourself were even available for that creative download? What spiritual practice, what energetic sort of connection do you think even led you to be available for the inspiration that day? You know, I think that I don't like to, you know, do something that I don't enjoy. I don't like to be forced to do anything. Um, I like to really do what feels good. And I think that, you know, growing up, my family was always encouraging me, you know, to do what I wanted to do. They weren't trying to control me ever. And I think that part of that was because, you know, my parents were busy. They were doing their own thing. Like my dad was a doctor, orthopedics, like he worked with the Texas Rangers. He was like always, you know, working. And, um, 
And, you know, my mom did a lot too. She was a busy person. And I think that because they were slightly removed, um, it was just enough to like them not control me. And I think that that makes me more available to like any idea, you know, it's like, I, you know, I'm always like, it's really interesting because obviously most, I think most parents want to kind of control what their kids do. And I get that. Like, I like to control things too. And I would think that like, you would want to kind of guide them and help them and whatever, but like we really, you know, to kind of step back and let them figure out stuff that they deep inside feel and want is so much more powerful because like, we're not our parents, you know, like I'm not my parents and, and they're not me. And so there's no way that they could have you know, orchestrated my life better than me really doing it myself. Um, and so I think that since that was the way that I grew up, you know, when I became a little older and I had this, this experience, I think that when I realized how much I loved making the clothes, um, you know, I could, I could identify with that being so different than other jobs that I had. And, you know, I think that it was important that like I started working and stuff at a pretty young age, cause I was able to kind of figure out things I liked and didn't like and whatever as well. Um, and yeah, it was just, I think that I was just a just open-minded more than anything to the idea that I could pretty much make anything I wanted a career. I just had to figure out what I wanted to do, you know, with my time. And I, and, and I was the person that like, if I really didn't like something, I was out, you know, I was like, no, sorry. Like, I don't like this job. I'm gone. Yeah. Um, obviously I would commit like as much time as, you know, it takes to really figure that out. But like, I don't like to stay in something that doesn't feel good very long. And I think that it felt so good when I was making the clothes that, um, and obviously it felt good for other people to recognize it and enjoy the clothes as well that, you know, I just realized that's what I was supposed to be doing. Um, it just felt so different, but yeah, I think like you have to just be open to anything because I mean, there were even people that, that were, were telling me at, at the early, at the young stage, they're like, yeah, I see you're making clothes, but like, is that actually a career? Like, is that what you're going to do with your life? Like there were definitely a few of those people along the way. And I was like, yeah, like I'm selling it. I'm making money. Like, this is great. You know, some people, as a, if you're a young girl with a sewing machine, they're not looking at that as like a career. Um, and I think that, you know, you really have to just understand that anything can be a career, literally anything. Um, if you love it enough and, and you're going to work hard enough, like you can make anything that you love a career. You know, it's really, all of that is so true and fun to hear you say. And uh, when you started, there's so many people who listen to the show who would take themselves out of the whole process because they'd be like, well, who am I to like show up with something messy, right? Like, as opposed to, if you think about what it is now, what the brand aesthetic is now versus what it was that first day when you went to Abikini and sold $8,000 worth of stuff, it has advanced and pivoted and become so much more than it was. And yet a lot of people will be like, oh my God, who am I to do this right now? Like all I have is these messy patches and I don't know. And it's like, no, you have to be willing to begin there, right? So what would you say to somebody who's like, but I'm comparing myself to Aviator Nation as it is right now as a six zillion dollar brand. And you would say, what to those people? Yeah, I mean, if, if the people, first of all, you know, I would say that in the beginning, I had no idea that it would be this big now. And it brought me honestly, just as much joy then um, that it brings me now. And so I think that one thing to realize is the joy isn't in the numbers. It's more in the like, okay, like I'm supporting myself and I'm doing what I love you know so like there's a lot of levels so instead of saying like when I was starting I was not thinking oh I want to be you know a uh, hundred million dollar whatever company a year 500 million dollar company like I wasn't thinking about the numbers at all I was literally thinking oh this is so cool I'm doing what I love like if I can pay my rent you know then I'm good you know and and even if you know like you have to supplement the the passion for something else to help pay the bills but it's really more about like just just tuning in to what you love and not worrying about the numbers because the numbers will come if you are focused on making the product great and so I say like you know 
don't stress about the big picture, about the business plan and the financials and all of that. Don't stress about that. I mean, I literally did not go to school for business. I did not get an investment. My theory was as long as I'm making more money than I'm spending, then I'm doing good. And, um, and that was always my thing. And so I would keep track of what I was spending and I would keep track of what I was making. And I was like, okay, I need to not spend as much if I'm not making as much. And that's the most simple way to look at it. And, um, and really like just focus on, you know, the product and just, you know, not spending too much and just really perfecting the product. Um, and, and then, you know, sell to a store that, you know, is a good fit. And even if you're selling to one store, fine, then they're going to talk and, you know, then you're going to sell to two stores. And, you know, I didn't do this overnight. It's been 17 years. Um, and so I think that, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, maybe it happened, you know, a few years ago, but it was just literally one year at a time doing $5,000, $10,000, $30,000, $50,000, like a gradual thing, which is great because then when you make a mistake, it's not crazy. You can fix it. You know, you can keep going. Um, You know, it's not as much pressure if you don't get investment dollars from people. So I always say, try not to do that, um, you know, because it's more pressure and it's not as much fun. And, you know, you really have to focus on the product itself and, and not let, you know, the, the financials destroy you and stress you out. Cause if you're having fun, you're going to work harder and you're going to do it, um, for longer. And if it's not fun and you're stressed out, then, you know, you're not going to last very long. So I think that the way that, you know, it really became big was that I, I loved it and I still love it every single year. And the reason is I took it slow. Um, you know, I did not take on a big debt and, you know, I've always really focused on the product more than anything, you know, it's like making sure you have a good product. The rest kind of falls into place. I just find that so fascinating and powerful that you just like, let it be step by step by step and you don't get too big, too fast. And that way you can, you're right. You can course correct if you need to. And the fact that you've grown this to hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and you didn't go raising millions of dollars of VC money is like unheard of. It really is amazing. Speaking of money for a second, you know, one of the things that bothers me really bothers me on behalf of women, especially who I talk to listen to the show is they're such over givers. And when it comes time for them to start a business, they always feel bad charging. It's so funny to me. I'm like, why? If someone painted your house, you would want to paint, uh, pay the person, right? Like, of course. So I'm like, what is it about you that you don't let yourself get paid? Like, stop it. And it's funny because it's all, it's like this codependent need to please in a way where like, you are like, well, I want to be accessible. So it's okay. If someone can't pay, I'll still do it. It's like, well, then you can't make a business out of it. And you in particular, um, you know, Aviator Nation is not, it's not sold at the dollar store. It's not something I can buy at Target. I value that it's not the cheapest sweatshirt because I value the way it feels when I wear it. I like how soft it is. I like the colors of it. I like that it feels like something that when I buy that for myself, I feel like I'm treating myself. And so I like the price, just the price alone, even forget the softness. I like all of it. I like all of it. But I think that women who are listening especially could benefit from hearing how you allowed that to be how you didn't say, no, no, don't pay me. Or if you're going to pay me, pay me $7. It's like, no, I can't make organic food for you for $7. Like if you want the organic wild salmon, I can't make it for four bucks. I need you to pay me more. Right. So it's like, can you help us get into your headset about what you hear inside your mind around that? Because I really think you're doing it with such grace and you're still such a nice human. It's not like all of a sudden you're not nice, but you're making lots of money and you're making something great in exchange. And that feels really okay to me. But for so many people, Paige, that really doesn't feel safe to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I think that the way that I started with figuring out you know, what to charge people and all of that was that I, it's actually funny. I have a journal that I, I, I opened up the other day and when I was making the clothes and I, and I knew that I was going to sell them at the street fair, I had no idea, you know, what I was going to charge for them. And so I started ha- thinking about it because I knew I was going to have to price the clothes. And so what I did was I actually kept track of every step 
that I went through to make the garment and how long it took me to do that step. And so I have like literally so rainbow on sleeve, like five minutes, like whatever it was, like cut out the fabric, 10 minutes. Like I kept track of, of literally every step of the, of the process because there was a lot that went into it, you know, sewing the garment, dyeing it, you know, I mean, all of it. And so, um, so anyway, then I basically, I had my job at the, at the surf shop. And so I thought, okay, like if I was making this much money an hour, like this is what I would have to pay plus the materials and everything. And then obviously like you have to make a margin. So then, and everybody in retail, like just, you know, they just doubles the price of the cost or whatever to get to the wholesale price and to get to the retail price they double the wholesale and so I knew that math and so I knew that I had to be at this number um so to like get to this number so anyway basically what I did is I kept track of the cost and then I doubled that price to get my wholesale and then I doubled that to get my retail because that was the mathematics that I knew um worked and that's how I got the price I literally did it that way and um and so I'm like okay because I wouldn't I wouldn't pay myself any less than the surf shop is paying me, you know? And so this is a fair price. And it, the thing is the garments took a long time to make, they were details. And so that's why, you know, the price is expensive and still today, like the garments are still expensive to make. And obviously there's other expenses now, like, you know, all the, you know, health insurance for the employees and the workman's comp and the payroll taxes and course, everything that goes into having a factory in California, um, which is a huge expense, um, you know, which is part of the reason the garments are the price the way they are, but it does go down to the cost. Like I, I don't do some crazy margin. I just basically look at the cost and then I double that. Um, to get the wholesale price. And I think that when you're starting a company, you have to realize that you have to, you have to charge somebody for it. And so you figure out what it costs to make it, you know, and add your time in there, you know, don't forget that you are part of it and what would you be paid, you know, and, and like the job that you're doing. And, and even if you start modest, like you still have to do it um, that way, because you can't give away everything for free. And for you to continue doing it, you have to be able to support yourself. You know, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to continue making clothes that people love if I can't pay my rent and, you know, whatever. So, you know, that's what I tell people is like, look, like, like if the person loves your product, they want you to survive so that you can make it. So do what you need to do to pay yourself. Um, and yeah, that's just expected. That's necessary. It's totally necessary. And there's two really beautiful lessons in there. One is that it costs what it costs because of the costs involved, which is why Seth Godin said to me, low price is a race to the bottom, because if I want to make it cheaper, I can cut costs, right? Instead of giving you something that's organic, I'm using food as an example, right? I'm, I'll give you something that's synthetic, you know, it's cheaper to put corn syrup in things, right? It's like, so what do you really want to deliver? Right. Cause there's yeah. that part. Okay. There's that part. And then there's also the part you said paying yourself. I've actually never heard someone even put that as one of the costs. And that's where I think women need to listen up and hear that. Right. Like, why would you not pay yourself? What, what, what you should make less than you did at the surf shop. That doesn't make any sense. You got paid to stand there on your feet and do retail. You won't get paid to be a creator and actually sew something that doesn't make sense. That's a big paradigm shift. I think we're very codependent and we own, you know, we're, we're so worried. Someone's gonna say it's a hundred and what dollars for what, how dare you? And it's like, here's the thing. You can sleep at night because you know what it costs. You know what went into all of this. And you're you're going to let them think that. It's like, that's okay with you because not everyone's your customer anyway, right? No. So it's like, if they don't appreciate, you know, some people don't even like surf clothes or West Coast culture. They'll never be your person. Yeah, that has, that has to be okay is what you're saying. It just It's just, you're going to have to keep moving forward. Yeah, so, and- People need to understand that, that whatever product they're creating, like they're not, they're not serving everyone. I mean, it's probably very rare that everyone is your customer. So don't worry so much about what the price is, like make the price a fair price based on what it costs to make the, the item. And then, you know, like it'll all work out because I mean, like you said, not everybody is my customer, you know, my customer is the person willing to pay more for something made in America by hand you know, right. and uh, those are big yeah. differences. Yeah. Big, huge differences. Totally. Like if you, if people, and, if people, and the fabrics yeah. and the stuff, you know, I mean, 
and anybody that buys the brand, you know, knows that when they wash it, the stuff still feels amazing. And so the fabrics and the quality of everything that we do, you know, is known by people that buy it. And I think that, you know, the fabric cost is, is gigantic, you know, that we, you know, it, it, there's such a huge difference in cheap fabric and really, really good quality fabric. And, yeah. and, you know, people that wear Aviator Nation can feel it. They wash it. They know like it, it continues to feel good. And, and so, you know, they, they pay for it because they're getting the quality and the made in America. Yeah. yeah. My grandmother who grew up with like so much hardship and lived through the depression and all of that, I still have a cherry wood table that was her table. Like she had it in her house from like, this is like an 85 year old table. And I remember her saying that she paid a lot for it because she realized that if she wouldn't have gotten something that was this good material, it would have been expensive because it wouldn't last. So she said, is something that's expensive cheap or is something that's cheap expensive? Like if you have to keep replacing something, then did that, then did that thing from Ikea actually save you money or did it not that there's anything wrong with that? Cause there's a time and a place where like, it's the most perfect thing that you need, but long-term it's interesting what we view as an expensive and what we view as expensive. And you're right. All the, all the things you just said, I want to ask you one more question about the brand. Uh, maybe I'm lying. Maybe I'll ask you too, but one question I want to ask you is about branding. Okay. And like so much of what we've been talking about is in the vibration, like we said, the surfing West coast, how you felt in the shop. And for people who are selling things, how much do you think goes into the branding, the storytelling, the pictures, the way that we position the message and the way that we bring people into a world? Um, and how much do you think, uh, is just on the actual product itself and for branding, what have you, what have you learned that's really struck a chord with people that you would tell somebody else when you're thinking about your branding, this is something I've learned that really made difference for us. Yeah. I mean, branding is, is truly everything. First of all, I think I've always really been passionate about the branding because, you know, eventually a lot of things start to look alike. And, and if your, if your brand does not mean something, um, then, you know, you kind of get lost in the shuffle of, of everything going on. And so I think that, you know, it's, it's really important to choose a name that matters to you and to choose a logo that matters to you. And that really feels like the product, you know, and, and so that's important. And then as far as, you know, like, the continued message, it has to be consistent. Um, you know, the look of the branding materials and, and everything that you do has to look like the brand, you know, there's, it's often that I'll, I'll look at something and I'll be like, well, that's really cute. And that's super cool. That flyer you made, but it doesn't look like aviator nation, you know? And, and so it's really important to stay consistent. Um, I'm always like surprised when companies like change their colors of their logo and the the logo itself, even big companies. I mean, I guess they want to rebrand, but I mean, it's like, you know, why, why change it? Like you're, you're basically erasing what everybody knows about you already, unless you like, just want to like erase everything that we know about you, but you really have to stay consistent. You know, you have to put the, like I put our logo embroidered on every single garment. And that's a consistent thing that, you know, if you buy the garment, you know that it's Aviator Nation if it has that logo on it. And I think that that's cool that we do that because, you know, our clothes, like I like to design a variety of types of things. And so one garment might look totally different than the other just because of what I was inspired by that season, but everything has that logo embroidered on it. And so, you know, I think that having consistent logos and and just the use and the identity of the message and the colors and everything that you, you know, you cho- you've chosen your label to be, um, it's important. It's consistent. Uh, I think that the message is so important. Um, that's something that a lot of companies don't do so much. You know, it's like a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to start this thing. I'm going to sell it on Instagram. I'm going to sell it on on the internet or whatever, but it's like, what message, what story do you really have? If you can't tell a story about what you're doing, then, you know, I don't, I don't know how far you'll get, you know, because people really do care about the story more now, um, you know, and the message. And I think that having a powerful 
clear, consistent message and story is important. Even if it's something simple, um, it's like, you know, come up with a little story about why you're doing this and put it on the packaging or whatever. Um, I do think people care and I think it makes a difference. Packaging is obviously important um, for a lot of companies. I mean, for us, we don't really have that much packaging because, you know, it's like, it just doesn't have a lot of packaging, but so a lot, a lot, a lot of brands obviously sell a product where the packaging is important. And I think that um, just keeping it super consistent. And, um, and then, you know, a lot of times I ask myself, because obviously I have a lot of people that work for me and I'm like, okay, like that, those people really love, you know, that, that packaging or that message or whatever. And I'm like, but I don't love it. And like, like this is what I have to listen to because you know I created this for my heart and if I am ignoring what my heart is and doing what everyone else wants me to do then I'm going to get lost I'm going to turn into anything else you know it's like you have to kind of stay true it's like create your story in the beginning and then make sure you're staying true to that you know years later because it's easy to get you know kind of um just manipulated from everything going on around you and and it's easy to kind of become what everybody else is doing but you have to really stay true to your mission and and what you want yeah can i ask you a follow-up question about that do you yeah. have two more minutes okay of course um so you mentioned a lot in what you just said about not getting thrown off course and you also mentioned you have a lot of people now obviously who work with you, for you, all of that, because the business is so big. And a lot of times I'll talk to entrepreneurs who started out really loving it because it was just, you know, they were making cupcakes or they were whatever they were doing. And then they realize, wait, 99% of what I do now is managing a team and looking at all these things. And, and, and we have so many stores and so many products and things can then feel overwhelming, or you could very much start to feel pulled out of center and then start to go, what did I just build? I created a monster. It's so big. And it's, I feel like I'm drowning. How do you continue to find the joy in it and show up and be an actual boss? You're not just a boss in a vibe way. You're a boss. And, and, and how do you navigate that without starting to feel like I, I have to run away and sell this because it's, it's starting to really like feel hard, or I feel like I'm not feeling the way I used to feel, which was just carefree and on an adventure. I think that's a really important thing. I think a lot of the reason why sometimes the women I speak to don't go all in is because they actually are worried that they'll get everything to turn out the way it is for you. And then they're like, I don't know if I could set boundaries or if I could stay rooted or if I could find the joy in it. So forget it, but I don't know that it needs to be all or nothing. And it seems like you use the word fun a lot about how much fun you're still having. So how do you think you're doing that? Yeah, I think that, you know, I'm lucky with the industry that I'm in. I mean, lucky for me because my industry fashion is constantly changed. Like every three months, any normal fashion brand is dropping a new collection, you know, spring, fall, winter. Yep. You know, and so that's the nature of the fashion world is you have to literally create a new collection every few months um, with the way things move now. It's even more because, I mean, you know, it's more powerful to drop a new collection, you know, every two or three weeks, like, you know, so I'm literally dropping new collections constantly and that's how we stay successful. And that's how we keep people excited that are our customer. But the reality is my personality loves change and loves, you know, creating new things. Like I always have to be creating something new or I get super bored. And so lucky for me, that's also what the fashion industry demands of me. So for me, you know, I'm also the, you know, I design everything. So I get to create clothes and, and products that I love all the time. And um, yes, I'm also the president of the company. So I'm running the company and, and there's a lot of things that I have to do that I don't really love to do, but I set aside time every week to design and almost every single day I'm making creative decisions because, because I'll design products one day, but then the next day, the products that I designed two weeks ago are coming to me for approval on colors and whatever. So it's just constant creativity, um, which, truly is just the way that I've kind of designed my business because I, I want to have creative control because I am super picky about the creative and the colors and all of it. And I have to feel it and approve every little thing, but that also makes it really fun for me. So I think that, you know, 
I really am in the right industry for my personality. And I think that there are other people that, you know, some people want to be creative. Some people don't. Some people just want to meet this number or whatever. It's like, you have to know who you are and you have to know what makes you tick and what gets you excited. And then you have to make sure you're still doing that as you grow, you know, like you have to hire people obviously to do the things that you don't really want to do as much. Um, but you have to make sure that even as you grow, you're still doing the stuff that you really love. You know, maybe it's strategy for new product development or whatever. It's like, be involved in that. Even though you think that you should hire someone to do that, don't hire someone to do the stuff that you love. Like if I hired a bunch of designers to design you everything, wouldn't like I don't think I'd be having fun, you know? And like, and so I do, I design everything and it's crazy. And I'm like a mad scientist sometimes, but like, I love it, you know, like I actually love making the product and creating the product. And another thing is I love building stores, you know, like that's another you know, thing that I get to do that I try to do like at least one a year. And it's like, I get to walk into thing and it's like a canvas in real life. And I get to paint murals on the walls. And, you know, it's like so fun to build stores. And so, you know, I'm creating these things in my business that I love doing. Um, and yeah, sure. It's a little self-serving, but it's also the reason the company is successful is like, I'm making it my passion, totally. no matter how big we get, I'm still doing the stuff that I love to do in the company. And so I say that that's really how you stay with it. And mm -hmm. that's also really how you get through the hard times because everything is going to have hard times, but if you still love waking up in the morning and you're like, I can't wait to get to my desk or your office or whatever, which is truly how I feel. I mean, every day I like to work out in the morning and I drive home and every single day I have ideas in my head. I cannot wait to tell people about my ideas or design what I want to design. Or it's like, I still feel that way every day. And I think that you have to feel that way. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, then stop doing it, yep. you know, and go do what you're passionate about. Yep. Um, and that's, that's really like my big message to everyone is like, look, like do something that you really love doing. It doesn't have to be glamorous either. You know, it just yep. has to be something that you love. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's really, um, you know, how I continue to, to crush is like, I just love it. I know I can feel it so genuinely. And I want to ask you a question about what we just said about, cause when Howard Schultz was here, he was like, you know, everything's so easy when the, you got wind in your sails, but what about when the wind changes? <laughs> He's like, that's when it actually starts to, you know, that's when you start to see like how much of an entrepreneur are you? Like, what do you got? You know? And so no one really talks about that, but I'm curious for those of us who are really here for the real, real, if you were going to give yourself advice, looking back and seeing any kind of wins where, where things change and it gets hard, What's something that you might share with people that like, you know what, now I know this as being an entrepreneur, uh, this can, this, this sort of can, can happen. And here's now something I've learned that I won't let happen. Is it, is it an interpersonal relationship dynamic thing? Is it a, uh, branding thing? Like anything that you've gleaned from that, that you want to share? Yeah. I think that something that I wish I would have done at the very beginning that now I very much do, um, is valuing the people that are around you helping you working for you um as you grow because when i was starting out i like i don't know i think that i had i didn't even have my first store yet i was just barely kind of getting started and i think i was just so wrapped up because i was selling wholesale for a while and it was stressful at times and and um i remember that one of my this guy friend that's actually working for the company now still and he was with me in the beginning it was pretty much my first employee it was my good guy friend. Um, I like, we got, we got in a little argument about something um, with, I think the terms that we set up with some wholesale account or something. And we got in a little fight and he walked out and he left. And, and I was so hurt um, because I lost him um, as a friend, but like, you know, it taught me this lesson of like, oh my God, like I need to value these people that are helping me and tell them that I value them and, and really build something with the people because they're so important. I mean, when he left, like I was distraught, like I was 
sad, you know, it affected me for a while, whatever. Um, you know, the big story is he eventually came back and, and he works for the company now and we're great. But, you know, it was a moment. And, and I definitely had other moments like that the first few years of the company. And I think that I grew as a person. I mean, I was super young, you know, and I realized shit like like you really have to value the people around you or they're not going to stick around, you know? And, um, and so I, I really made a shift a few years in where I really, you know, tried to just really be friends with, and, and not just friends, but like work alongside the staff and, and value their opinion and, and encourage them. And, and if they didn't like, I mean, one of the big things in my company is if you don't like your job, like let's create the job that is actually what you want. Oh, so um, cool. Yeah. What a I'm concept. Like, <laughs> totally. And I really believe in that because I believe that everyone's different and there's no way to really know until you get in there. And our company is big enough now that we can really create any job that you want. So it's like, okay, you hate doing that. Like, what do you love doing? And so let's try to move you into that. At least try to like get you molded into this. If that's your dream job. And, and, um, you know, one girl came to me, uh, like, I don't know, this was probably like seven or eight years ago. And I was in, and I just really liked her as a person. And I was interviewing her and I asked her, I was like, well, okay. And she was going to work in the sales floor in the Abbott Kinney store, um, just a salesperson. And I was like, because I used to interview everyone like in the beginning. And I asked her, I said, well, what is your dream job? You know, like if you could do anything. Um, and I knew she was special. Like we just, she was just so good. And I really wanted her to work for me. And, and she was like, well, she was like, my dream job would really be to travel around and open stores, you know? And I said, okay. I said, well, if you come in and you kick ass, like I'm promising you right now, you will travel around and open stores. And here we are like eight years later. And she's my, she literally travels around and, and helps me open all my stores. And, but she started on the retail floor. And, and the thing is like, she knew what she wanted. So it was easy, you know, and, and obviously I watched her and she was great at what she was doing. And, and so it worked But you know, I really do believe in listening to the staff and asking them, like, do you like this? Are you enjoying this? And obviously if they're not like trying to shift their situation um, to be something they enjoy. So I think valuing the staff um, is something that, you know, everybody really, you know, overlooks in the beginning a little bit. And it's so critical. I mean, it's just, you know, if, if your team, I'm the kind of person that cares about, you know, how the feelings of the people around me. And so, if they're not happy, then I'm not happy, you know? And, and so like, if they love what they do, then everyone's vibing on that. And it makes us all better. You know, it makes me better on a day to day and, and the people working for me all better as well. So I think that that's, you know, something that I've realized is just super important as we grow. Okay. I promise this is the very last thing I'm going to ask you no because worries. my, uh, my best friend's husband has been won all these Emmys for being the editor of the amazing race for years. And I knew that you were on the amazing race and reason I bring that up is because often when people come to me and ask me a question, they say, this is a business question that they have. It's really a courage question. And so much of what you've had to do since you began this is learn to solve the next problem before you even know what the problem is, right? Like your first trade show, you're like, oh my God, how do I even fulfill that many orders? Or what's my next move? Or how do I set up a factory in California? Or how do you get this license? Or whatever the hell it is, it's like, it's bringing home a newborn baby. You don't yet know exactly, even if you read the baby book, you're, you're on the job, learning the job, right? And so I say the thing about the amazing race and connection, just because We've had so many people come on the show who talk about how being an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to take a risk. You, you have to have an appetite for not trying to control and predict things and being up for the adventure. And you even said like, I kind of like having to pivot and do new collections. Like I'm, I think that this is a big thing that people are scared to death of like the change and not knowing. And so instead of allowing their creativity to come out and building something and allowing themselves not to know, and then figuring it out and finding the adventure in it, they just feel scared to death by that. And so they'll trade their whole life for a predictable day job, even if they're the person who has a good idea, because all of that adventure actually feels way too scary. And so you of all people, just given the, the things I said about you, I think you have something that I think you could write a book on that. Because I think one of the main things about you and your personality is allowing and welcoming adventure and problem solving to be okay without putting some kind of perfection or, or pressure on yourself, because you kind of know that this is like how it's going to roll. 
So I want to hear what you have to say, and then we'll wrap up to people who just are oriented to be scared or rather than they are feeling like it's okay. We'll figure it out as we go. What would you say to those people about that? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, the reality is to, if you want to start something and you want to do something new, then you have to understand that what comes with that is a little bit of unknown you know, it's just a given. And like, so you have to realize that every time that you try something, you're going to learn, you know, whether you did it right or not right, or, you know, you made money or you didn't make money, like either way, like you have to understand that if you're not making the mistakes and you're not trying these things, you're not growing at all, you know? And I mean, I still have things that, that, I, that happen to me almost every day that I grow a little bit, and I think that once you, once you have a problem or you have some major catastrophe happen and you fix it, you start to get stronger. Sure. And so like, it, you kind of like grow on that, you know, because it's like, there's going to be your first big problem, you know? And so my, 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 what I say to them is, look, you're going to have that first big problem, get through that first one, no matter what, and then see how you feel. And what you're going to feel is so accomplished because you got through it and you're also going to know that it like you're going to be able to predict like okay like that could happen again like I already know how to handle it so now you've got more tools you know in your tool belt and you're like look like and then the second one comes along and it's a little bit easier than the first mm -hmm. but it's like that first big one that's hard and it's tricky and no matter how big it is I say just get through it do whatever it takes to fix that problem um, and make the best of it because as you go like it gets easier I mean now it's like people bring me problems all the time and yep. I'm just like okay I'm like no big deal you know and they're like how is that no big deal I'm like because like I mean it's not like someone's dying you know like come on it's like you realize that that's just the nature of business. Even a company, you know, like Aviator Nation that obviously is, we've been around as long as we have. I mean, we're still dealing with little hiccups along the way. You know, there's still that time where the, the color doesn't come out right and the pants don't match the hoodie and, you know, or the, the zipper doesn't work right and whatever. How do we take all the zippers out? Like, okay, you know, that's just part of the garment industry. You know, you have to just realize that like, you're going to have people leave you. You're going to have people walk away. What happens? It opens up the door for somebody new and amazing. You know, like I think that I used to be really terrified of people leaving and luckily not a lot of people have left me, but you know, I think that, you know, like every single time somebody does leave, it really does open this amazing thing for like someone new and awesome to come in. So now I'm like, if you don't want to be here, leave. Like, I don't care. Like we've got someone new and great, like waiting to come in. So I think that no matter what could happen, it's literally something that's making you grow. And that is the way to grow a business. You know, yeah. that's the way to grow yourself is like those, those little things. And Amazing Race was like, I mean, I don't know if anybody watched my season, but Blake and I, my brother, like we made a lot of mistakes, but the thing is we like did a lot of problem solving on the fly. And I think that all of the mistakes and, and we ended up I don't want to spoil it. I guess I shouldn't spoil it in case somebody wants to watch it. But I mean, the thing is, well, I guess everybody knows I didn't win. So like the you came close, end, you came really close. You came really close. Um, but in the end, you know, not winning was so bad for me. You know, I was 21 years old. I was so pissed. Like I, it was just so hard to lose. But the, but I mean, imagine like, like eight weeks of travel and, and all of it and losing in the end by four minutes, you know, it was awful. And, but the thing is, you know, I woke up the next day and I was like, okay, like now, how am I going to make that money that I thought I was about, I thought I was about to have a million dollars. It's gone, you know? So what am I going to do? Cause now I know that I want it. Like, you know, whatever, like let the things that bring you down, like really kind of fuel you, you know, to do it better and stronger. And you just, you have to look at the heart, the hardships is something that's a positive. It actually, the, I mean, without the hardships, you would have no growth, zero. I am just so impressed. Every word is such value, everything that you're giving. And I notice you have, not only do you have lightning bolts on so many things, but you have them on your nails, the lightning oh, bolts. What, what's with the lightning bolts? Why do you love lightning bolts so much? So to me, lightning bolts represent positive energy. And that is like a huge thing for me. Um, 
because it really is like, I just believe in energy, like not even in like a frou-frou way, but like, like if you walk into a room and you smile at someone, like they smile back at you, you know? And it's like, and the, and I know that, you know, like how much better I feel when people are smiling at me or kind to me or whatever. And so anyway, I just believe energy is really powerful. Um, and I think that the brand Aviator Nation creates this kind of positive energy. And I always wanted it to create a positive vibe and energy for the people buying it, the people wearing it, the people working at the company. I'm always like, positive vibes only like if you're in a bad mood like go home take a sick day whatever like don't bring it here and so anyway the lightning bolt for me was always like a positive energy thing and so like when I look at my nails which I, I put lightning bolts on them always now I'm like looking at them and I'm like that reminds me be positive you know like like okay that sucked for a minute but you know what like let's be positive and so that's just kind of like I don't have any tattoos but it's like my reminder because the bolts are all around me and the designs and um, I'm like, okay, like that represents positivity for me. And so that's well, why that's, I always use it. That's such a beautiful place to end it. Because I said that to you when we first started talking that your energy is just like fireflies and uh, it is all energy. You know, it's what, it's what the person felt when you walked into Fred Siegel. It's really what sells it. It's really what allows people in, into wanting to be in your space and work for you and with you and it's so cool. So just tell everybody in case they don't know, or they need to hear it, especially now leading into the holidays, uh, where they can find Aviator Nation, where they can follow you, where they can get their hands on it, just send them somewhere. And then we'll put all the links in the show notes. Yeah. So you can buy Aviator Nation on our website at aviatornation.com and you can follow all the new collections, um, on our Instagram page. We're always talking about the new drops. And that is at Aviator Nation. And you can follow me at Paige Mykoski. And I post a little bit of personal life stuff. And I post uh, a lot of fun projects. When I'm building out a store, I'm always posting that. And um, sometimes I post stuff on new designs that I'm working on. So yeah, that's it. I love it. You're so, so awesome. Thank you for electrifying all of us with everything. It was just so cool. So cool. cool. Thank you for having me. It was super fun.